All right. I almost did teach on the glory of Jerusalem and the millennial kingdom. Really, up until like last night, uh, I thought I'd teach on another topic. Um, a little more personal. And uh, in many ways, these last three years of our lives, of my life for sure, but my wife and I's, have probably been the most difficult years we have ever experienced in our lives. I mean, just, just, just like really, really, really intense, really, really difficult. And so this, this word tonight is really just the, the byproduct of these last three years. And I'm weird. I like titling things. So the title of it is The Glorious Gift of Suffering. Now, I know you heard about suffering last week. So we're going to hear about it again tonight. And I don't know what God is saying about that. But I feel this thing about suffering, and, and I want to talk about it tonight. Now, here's what I want to say. I don't want to overly glorify suffering. Because I think sometimes it's, it, you, you can get into this weird place where you can, especially you know, I've worked at the underground church for the last few years, you can overly glorify suffering, or you can overly glorify martyrdom or these things, but I don't want to do that. But, but I do want to look at it tonight because I believe that suffering is one of the, the most overlooked, underappreciated, and missing components in a lot of the Western church, especially the charismatic church. I want to be careful that we don't become so, I, I, I might be a little offensive tonight, that's not my heart, but just go on a journey with me tonight. I want to make sure that I'm not so locked into my classical charismatic theology that I miss deep places God has, is inviting us to that might be a little bit offensive. Right? Because here's what I have found in the last few years. Now, let me just, before I say what I'm going to say, I am a faith person. My wife and I, for our entire marriage, we have lived by faith. We have gone to, four, I, mean, I don't know how many nations, how many continents, and we have raised hundreds, not hundreds, but tens, probably hundreds accumulated, but tens of thousands of dollars a year believing the Lord to go to nations, and we've done amazing things. I am a faith person. But do you know what I found in the last few years? So God doesn't always come how I want him to come or when I want him to come. And then sometimes there's things that I'm asking God to heal or to touch. And not only does he do, he not only does he not come, he lets the thing die. Yeah. It's a really, really, really intense thing. Like to, just to, to, to really believe in the love of God when sometimes I feel like the way God loves us feels a lot more like rejection sometimes. And so I want to just kind of bring us on this journey. I'll share a couple of things. We'll look at a whole bunch of verses. And then share a little bit, just, just some stories of, of the last few years. But I want to say this again. I really believe this. That one of the most key missing components. If we don't get this, if we don't, as charismatic, as spirit-filled people, as people of faith, if we don't begin to develop a robust, deep, rich understanding of the role of suffering in producing the glory of God, we are going to be greatly offended with the Lord in the next few years. It's important that we get this because now I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm very optimistic. I'm super extroverted, but I'm also very, very, very aware. I was going to make a political statement, but I'm trying to behave. <laughs> I'm very aware that whatever your preferred political party is, isn't going to lead us into glory. And I'm also very aware, like I believe we are going to see the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in human history in the next few years. I believe we are going to see manifestations of the glory of God like we've never seen. But it is going to coincide with the most difficult periods of human history. Because in the leadership of Jesus, pressure produces glory. And we don't like pressure, and we don't like suffering, and we don't like persecution because we're Western, you know, we're, 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 like, we are the country that goes to the airport in pajama pants. <laughs> like, no, for real. 
Nothing says more about the theology of our country than the airport. And we have this, like, and, and, and I want to I want to hit at this tonight, because I am concerned. I travel a lot and I go to places. the The addiction to comfort is going to be a big stumbling block for a lot of us in the days ahead. I mean, like, not just the addiction to comfort, the prerequisite of comfort to worship, or oh, the prerequisite of comfort. For obedience or the prerequisite of everything, you know, because I'm a, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm a word of faith, and, and we want to control the Lord. And I found in some of the worst ways these last few years, it doesn't work that way. But if you allow the Lord to bring you through that process of suffering, then you find a glory much greater than you'll ever experience in a service. Because we've, we've, we've traded the glory of the empty tomb for the glory of a good meeting. Like we're just like, like, that's where we've come sometimes, right? And so for many of us, I said this, but I'm trying to keep focus. It's a new goal of mine in 2023. <laughs> so I, I got a new admin, Jillian, best admin. Keeps me organized and reminds me of everything, but I forget to do them even when she reminds me. But I want to say this is important for so, so many of us. The addiction or the allegiance to the God called comfort or convenience has robbed God the worship that we actually say we're giving him. So we think that because we sing to the Lord that we worship the Lord. Or like, you know, or, or, or our worship, or that our worship Sometimes I think our worship is determined even by the intensity with which we sing songs. Do you know, it is absolutely possible to spend years of your life singing all of the right songs to God and get, doing all the right responses and actually never worshiping. Because your worship isn't determined by what you sing. Friends, the God, what you think about the most, you worship. That's the truth. What, 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 the, the one, it, it's, it's, it's that which you give yourself to in the deepest part of your heart. That is who sits on the throne of your heart. And I'm telling you where we are getting ready to come on the earth is God in his goodness, but in his justice is getting ready to expose half-hearted fake worship. This is where we are. Like we have right now in America, in the West, we have a very, a uh, 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 polluted worship culture because we're okay with people writing songs about a God they don't even believe in. And we make the crux of Christianity what we do in a room corporately when God isn't, at, God isn't as moved by what you do in this room. He's moved by who you are when everything is coming against you. See, here's what happens. We'll sing these great songs and we'll make these great play, uh, prayers and then the Lord will test to see if what you sang was really true. Now, I'm going to be really honest. Like, I've been to a lot of places, done a lot of things, blah, 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 blah. I found out in 2020 that I got to a place. I just, it was just a lot of talk for me. I was just like, I was like absolutely confronted by the Lord in 2020. I realized that you know, you, 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 you do ministry enough and you, see, one of, the, one of my favorite things in the world is language. Like understanding things and, and having a rich, but one of the most dangerous things in the world is language. Because you could spend your whole life talking about something you don't even possess. And when you're mostly surrounded by people, I'm not talking about you in this room, I'm talking about in general. When you're mostly surrounded by people that don't even possess the thing we're all singing about, nobody notices that we don't have the thing that we're talking about. Can I propose that possibly for many in the body of Christ, especially in the West, that's where we are. We're like Israel right before King David shows up on the scene. They don't have the Ark of the Covenant. They don't have the presence of God for almost 15 years. They're still showing up to the tabernacle of Moses. They're still offering sacrifices. They're still doing everything as though God is with them. And nobody even notices the fact that the Lord isn't even in their midst. 
In 2020, you guys remember COVID? Yes. <laughs> I lived in Philadelphia. It was real there. <laughs> like, I remember I needing to drive to my mother-in-law's house and wondering if I was going to go to jail. Like, it was intense. And, I, and, and one of the best things that happened in COVID is that I couldn't travel and minister anywhere. And it's amazing when you have to search the Lord, seek the Lord without an agenda. Because I didn't realize how shallow my walk with the Lord had become. Had become. I want you to hear me when I say this, all right? Just, just don't, don't get, you know, I said things intense the way I was made. Ask my wife. I'm constantly having to say, no, I didn't mean it that way. I'm sorry. But like, I realized how shallow my walk with the Lord had become because I had developed this encounter-driven, and what, I'm not against encounter, but Jesus doesn't call us to the place of encounter. He calls us to the place of abiding. I'm thankful for encounters, but friends, encounter ain't going to carry you through tribulation. Abiding will. I didn't realize how I was just encounter-driven and everything in my life. Like, I live with this weird, ungodly, unhealthy, put on me by people pressure, and everything was surrounded about this. I got to be anointed, so when I minister, it's anointed. That was it. That was the extent. I didn't realize I'd gotten there because people would move when I would preach, and I would get, in, you know, revelation, and, 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 and there was more and more platform, and more and more favor, and more and more money and more and more recognition, and things were going, and I was really happy, and everything was going good until June of 2020. I'm sitting before the Lord in my balcony. The Lord speaks to me, and he says, you have gotten to a place where you only do ministry when you're on a platform with a microphone in your hand, and someone's giving you a check, and I'm grieved with you because it's not what I died for. That's what the Lord told me. And I wasn't like, I thought I was, I was like, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> and, 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 and it was a whole you know, series of weeks, but I felt like, and I'm not saying you need to do this, but I felt like the Lord told me to kill my ministry. So I, here's what I want you to do. He said, you, you've, you've bought into machine ministry. You're not even living real life anymore. And I've shared this here before. This whole journey began in July of 2019. I, my wife and I used to help lead this really massive ministry, and we do these massive gatherings with famous people, blah, blah, blah. And I was sitting in a hotel room in Austin, Texas, July of 2019. I'll never forget this. Uh, I, the, the Lord spoke to me. I was getting ready to speak. I was the main speaker the last night. I wanted this, like, home run word. And the Lord said, you're this close to being good enough to do this without me. You're, so, you're in such a dangerous place. That's what the Lord told me. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that you could get so good at ministry that actually it's better if the Lord doesn't come because Jesus will often be the greatest inconvenience to the kingdom of yourself that you're trying to build. You know what I mean? Like, like I just realized how inconvenient Jesus' leadership actually is. And so June 2020, he says, no, I want you to kill it. Kill your website, kill your social media. And he began to deal with things, right? And we're going to look at a few things here. I promise I'm going to get in the Bible. Don't freak out. But he started saying things. And I'm not telling you you need to do this, but the Lord just started challenging me and saying, I want you to stop requiring things of people to go and minister. I want you to stop making demands on people. And he said, you've, you've bought into machine ministry. I'm going to teach you how to get your hands dirty again. If you're supposed to be a fisher of men, why don't you smell like fish anymore? Oh, I had become so engrossed in ministry, I forgot to follow the Lord. And so what does the Lord do? The Lord sends a precious, beautiful little gift to us called suffering. And suffering, we'll do a couple of things. See, number one, it is going to reveal if you've got substance. See, the proof of substance, we're going to look at verses here. The proof of substance is not found in how good you can preach. I've just walked through one of the worst months. Actually, this three-year season has been capped with one of the worst months of my life. And here's what I'm finding. You can live in tremendous sin and be incredibly anointed. 
You can live. It's possible, I'm telling you. In tremendous sin and move crowds. You can live in tremendous sin and raise millions of dollars for ministry. That's it. Our great minister, most of what impresses us doesn't even impress the Lord. I'll never forget this. Mike Bickle tells this story. He was walking at IHOP. And there was this random old lady. And the Lord said, she's greater than you. <laughs> That's what the Lord told him. And he said, God, if you know Mike, he's like, God, I started IHOP. And you hear his voice. He's like, blah, blah, blah. and the Lord said, yeah, no, no, no. I know you've done all that. She has more humility than you do. Therefore, she's greater than you. Wow. <laughs> it's just amazing. The things that blow our minds. All right, you guys ready to jump in some passages? Yes. Well, let's read this one first, and we'll go to First Peter. I, who loves the promises of God? Yes. Raise your hand. Yes. You love the promises of God? Yes. Well, I've got one for you. It says 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Here's, here it is. You ready? Yes. Say yes. yes. Say all. Are you part of the all? Yes. All right. Who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. <laughs> now put that on your bulletin for the guests next week. Oh, but it's a promise. Because suffering and persecution, these different things, it is part of the process of growing into Christ's likeness. Let me say it like this. If you have never experienced any measure of suffering in your walk with the Lord, I doubt if you've got a real walk with the Lord. It's easy to fake tongues. You can even fake prophecy if you know a little bit about people. But man, when, when, when suffering comes and God begins to show you what the real substance, what you really have, there is no faking it through persecution. Like you can't fake betrayal. You can't fake your way through, through, through betrayal. You can't fake your way through uh, a persecution. You can't fake your way through the denial of earthly coming. You can't fake your way through that stuff. You have to have a real deal, deep life in God if you are going to endure real suffering. All right, let's go to 1 Peter. We're going to look at a lot of passages. Are you guys good with that? 1 Peter has become a dear friend of mine in this season. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me just say this real quick before I go to 1 Peter 1. See, one of the things that happens is that we get so engrossed and to the comfort thing that we will often find ourselves rebuking the very thing that God is sending to help us fulfill our destiny. I'll give you a perfect example. It would be impossible for Jesus to fulfill his destiny if God didn't give him Judas. But just think about that. Like, like Judas is as vital to the story as anybody else in the gospel. He's a part of it. I mean, do you understand, as a Gentile, you could not stand before a holy God and sing to him and him receive your worship if a man named Judas had not betrayed Jesus and sent him to the cross. Judas, the Judases in your life are as important as the intercessors in your life. Because the thing on this side of eternity that God has called you to, beloved, isn't a platform, it's a cross. And you can't get to the cross without Judas. So here's, here's what we do. When Judas comes, we pray him away, we rebuke him, we cancel him, we send all of our intercessors, we throw salt, we dance. Do you know what Jesus did when Judas came? He put him on the executive leadership team of his ministry. Like, Jesus, fully God, fully man, right? Go read Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. That Jesus, fully knowing who this man was, doesn't pray him away, doesn't rebuke him. He puts him on the, ex he wants him as close as possible to make sure that nothing hinders him from going to the cross. 
I just remember this. I had a dream. I don't remember. I feel like Josh. Said that. At some point I had a dream, but in the dream I was standing on the platform of the ramp and this phrase came out of my mouth. I said, it's time to preach the cross again at the ramp. And even this morning, I was sitting with, I could hear that old you know, Jason Upton song. With the, I'm not going to sing it because that would ruin your ministry. But the cross, the cross is always ready every day. You know. But we would pray Judas away. Here's what Jesus does. If you, if you know anything about Jewish custom, Judas' seat at the Last Supper, it's a Passover Seder, was the seat of the guest of honor. Because it was the guest of honor that gets to dip the bread with the host of the supper. I want to live, and maybe this sounds weird, but whatever. I want to live in such a level of surrender and brokenness that I would even make room for the Judases in my life because I understand how God might use them to make me more like Jesus. That was the last thing I'll say on that. And then I'll, I want to go to First Peter. Do you remember what Jesus said to Judas on the night of his betrayal when Judas came and betrayed him? It's one of the most profound things. With Judas, and, I, and I'm telling you, I am walking through it. Massive betrayal right now. I, I, I'm in it. I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you. Jesus looks at Judas, his betrayer, and he says, friend, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss. Oh, that the Lord would bring us to such a place of broken, that's real worship. Yeah. To look at Judas in the hour of betrayal and say, friend. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. You guys good? Yeah. Very encouraged, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's look at this. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 6. I love 1 Peter. It is a brilliant, brilliant book. I think it's so underrated. We don't read out of 1 Peter enough. Because it's not very comfortable or exciting. But we're going to look on like, like 30, 40 verses. Are you guys good with that? Good. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Look at this. In this, you greatly rejoice. Talking about the return of the Lord. Even though now for a little while, say this, if necessary. That's a massive statement. Because suffering, and I forgot to mention this earlier, not all suffering is spiritual warfare. Some of it is godly leadership. Some of you are rebuking, not the enemy, but the hand of God working and moving in your life. Think about this. On the cross, Jesus isn't on the cross rebuking Satan. He's on the cross speaking to the Father because he understands his crucifixion as the leadership of the Father. So if necessary, it's part of it. God will, if you are serious about going after Jesus, there are times in your life you will suffer and it's not gonna be because you got a bad friend. It's not gonna be the devil. It's actually the Lord purifying you and perfecting you and making you an even greater offering of worship. Look at this. So if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Very comforting. Verse seven, this is, an incredible Bible verse. So that the proof of your faith. Being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I just want to take a minute on that verse because it's a glorious verse. Number one, contrary to popular belief, the genuineness of your faith isn't tested on a platform. It's tested on a cross. The genuineness of your faith is tested when God doesn't come or doesn't do or doesn't move the way you expect him to. When you want to know what you've got, you've got to suffer. Why? Because that's the whole purpose of fire is to purify. It's important that you get this, right? You know that Matthew 5, 8, beautiful verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know that there's a difference between purity and innocence? My two-year-old daughter is innocent. Purity is the byproduct of letting fire 
cleanse you, renew you, refine you. Those that are willing to suffer, they see God. Not the ones that get everything you ask for. Not the ones that always win. Guys, and, and let me just say this. I think one of the things that we really, 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 really need is a redefinition of what the abundance life is. The abundance life, abundant life. Let's, and I'm not against this stuff. But it has nothing to do with you getting a better car. When Jesus comes and says, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly, it has nothing to do with any material, earthly possession. It has everything to do with intimacy. It has everything to do with the knowledge of God. It has everything to do with real depth in God. Do you want to know what abundant life is? Hanging naked on a cross saying, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We're going to look at this in a minute, but I want to say this. I'm going to say this again. Don't just look at the crucifixion as a moment of atonement. Look at it as a ministry model. Jesus wasn't, see, two things happened on the cross. He didn't just die for you. He was modeling your posture. Jesus doesn't just come as God. He comes as man. He comes to be the pro. He is, listen, whoever your hero is, they're not the standard. Jesus is. And Jesus hung naked on a cross. That's the model. That's the standard. That's that naked, broken body on the cross is the abundant life. Oh, let's keep reading this. Well, let's keep looking at this verse. This is a glorious verse. So the genuine, you want to know how we knew Jesus was the real thing? Not by the miracles he performed. Not by walking on water. Not even by raising Lazarus from the dead. But the willingness to be crucified was the proof of the pudding. See, so many of you, you have missed massive opportunities because when God came to offer you a cross, you turned your back and ran the other way because it didn't fit within your theological framework. Now, why does the Lord do this? This is beautiful about verse 7. He's purifying us to prove the genuineness of our faith being much more precious than gold or silver. So what? So that it may be found to result. And, and here's the beautiful thing. It has nothing to do with you. This is the best part. It's not even about you. Everything the father does is about his son. This is an amazing verse. And there's so much in the New Testament about this. So that you may be found to the glory, honor, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Every time you see that little phrase, at the revelation of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, 10 out of 10 times it's talking about the second coming of Jesus. Because that is when Jesus is going to be fully revealed to the whole earth. And what is God saying? He's saying, here's what he's saying. He's saying, I am going to allow you to suffer, to go through fire, to be betrayed. Why? Because there's an hour coming. Now, we love to talk about, well, I can't wait to get my inheritance in heaven and my reward and my crown. That's cute. I get it. It's, you're going to have it for like 10 minutes. Because there's a moment coming. When the Father, before all of the earth, at the end of the age, is going to reward the Son. Do you understand what I'm saying? It has nothing to do with you fulfilling your calling. It has everything to do with the Father fulfilling His promise to the Son. For 2,000 years, in intercession, Jesus is looking at the Father and He's saying, Oh, Father, am I not worthy of the nations? And look at the scars in my hands and the wound in my side. Am I not worthy of Alabama? Am I not worthy of England? Am I not worthy of Jerusalem? Am I not worthy of the nations? And the Father looks at the beauty of the Son, looks at the faith. Do you understand? In the book of Hebrews, this is crazy. Do you understand your God lacked something? He liked the thing called obedience. This is, this is the profound mystery of this whole thing. Because he's suffering. We're gonna, I don't want to skip too ahead, but we get so riled up in the power, but the fellowship isn't found in the power. It's actually found in the suffering. Because new age people can have power, but only friends of God are willing to suffer with Christ. 
she, God in flesh had one thing he lacked, being fully God. He didn't, never had to obey anything. Think about this. Your God never, for billions of years, didn't know what obedience was. So he had to come and learn obedience. Your God had to learn something. Wow. Obedience. How did he learn it? By the things which he suffered. Our God, in whose image we were made to look like and be like, your God willingly submitted himself to a life of suffering so he could be qualified for an eternity of glory. This whole thing, this, all, everything you're going through really has very little to do with you. It has everything to do with the faithfulness of that man, Jesus. And the Father is going to reward him in front of all of the nations. And he's going to say, there's never been anybody more faithful. Nobody has ever obeyed like this man. There's never been wisdom. There's never been humility. There's never been beauty. I can imagine the Father reciting Philippians 2 over the Son in awe of this beautiful, humble, broken man. And then he's going to look at us and he's going to say, behold, the reward of your suffering. See, we suffer in order that we might be qualified to be the reward of his suffering. It's the suffering of your life. It's the Judases in your life. It's, the, it's when you pray for your loved one to get healed and they don't get healed and you still worship. It's when your spouse leaves you and they don't come back and you still worship. It's when your kid dies suddenly at a young age and you still worship. All of that is because the father is going to reward the son for his sufferings. And it's my suffering in this age that qualifies me to be the reward for his sufferings in the next. Let's keep going. Are you guys good? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at a bunch of more verses. Are you guys good with that? Okay, verse 18. Now, this is a good one. This is a fun one. <laughs> All right, you ready? I just want to give you the very straight up context. When he says servants, he's not talking about like humble believers. He's talking about people that are slaves in the natural. This is the context. The only reason I want to read this little portion is because I want to highlight this to us. One of the greatest hindrances to living this laid down life is to quit loving this life as much as we do. And some of you love your lives more than you love the Lord. I know I did. And I sure as heck loved my ministry more than I loved the Lord. And I loved preaching more than I loved the Lord. And so the Lord came to kill all of it. And we become so fixated on our social status and what people think about us because we've defined blessing and abundance with the wrong measuring stick. I'll say this again, the measuring stick of abundance is a cross, not a ruler, not a bank account, not your zip code. Well, there's only one here. <laughs> Thank God for that. In Philadelphia, I lived like two miles from my P.O. box and it was a different zip code. We still get packages sent to the wrong place. Look at this, verse 18 of chapter 2 of verse Peter. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. It's amazing. For this finds favor. Who wants some favor in your life? You know, we love that, right? Lord, send favor. Here's how you find favor. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. If you're wondering why you don't have favor in your life, maybe it's because you haven't learned how to suffer well. It was the man of sorrows and walked in the greatest amount of favor. Let's go to First Peter chapter 3. Can we keep going? Start at verse 13. 
Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. I'm telling you, as I began to really go deep in the New Testament, and I started comparing the apostles with a lot of the teaching I was hearing, something was missing. <laughs> right? As I was beginning to be trained in ministry and told, I would look at everything I heard, and then I start reading, and I was having a very difficult time to balance the two. One said I was balanced if I had status with Mary, a blessed if I had status with Marriott, but Peter said, I'm blessed if I suffer. I'm not against that stuff. I've got gold status with Marriott and Hilton. So don't get me wrong. And I use both of them. I'm not, so don't, I don't want you to leave here and feel like you have to go stay at the Howard Johnson. That would be horrendous. <laughs> but if you have to stay at the Howard Johnson, suffer well. <laughs> Here's the point. There's a little humor there. But anyway, I need you to get this. Sometimes I get so intense and everyone thinks I'm angry, but I'm really not. I'm really happy. <laughs> but here's the point. You can't just use that, do all, you know, whatever you do, whatever word to do, do it as unto the Lord when it comes to stacking chairs. Make sure whatsoever you do as unto the Lord, do it when they cheat you. Like make sure you do it when they cut you off in traffic. Make sure you do it when you're owed something and you don't get it. Make sure that you do it when you want to stay at the Hilton and you got the Howard Johnson. How many of you know Howard Johnson ain't even saved? It is disgusting. No, like, like, don't just, listen, don't just use those submissive verses to manipulate people to get them to obey you. Make sure you use those verses when nothing is going good in your life. Make sure when you're being cheated and robbed and you're in a long line at the Delta counter, you make sure that whatsoever, and I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you, that whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do it as unto the Lord. Let's keep going. Verse 15, okay. Oh, let's finish verse 14. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. You know, he's talking about persecution, physical. He's specifically are talking about people persecuting you for following Jesus. Now, this is something, for, for the most part, we have no grip. We don't understand that world, but you mark my words in the next few years. This verse will be as real here as it is in the Middle East. And I'm bewildered by the way people respond when I talk about persecution for our faith. But I won't get into that. Verse 15. Now here's the answer. But sanctify Christ as the Lord in your hearts. Uh, that sanctified Christ is ordering your hearts. If you write in your Bible, just, just put in there John 15. That sanctified Christ is Lord in your hearts. That's connected to Jesus' teaching in John 15 about abide in me, I in you, you in me, for without me you can do nothing. I want to say this. John 15, abide in me, I in you, for without me you can do nothing. Jesus was not talking about having an anointed ministry. That is not the context of John 15. John 15 has nothing to do with about you being, uh, I'm not saying you can't use it, but he's not talking about you being anointed to cast out demons. He's talking about being anointed to endure tribulation and persecution. That's the context. John 15 is connected to the Matthew 24 Olivet Discourse. Intimacy is how you get ready for persecution. Can I just propose a thought? This is the things I think about when I'm outside with my dog. <laughs> me and Sherlock have gone some deep places in God together <laughs> is, is, is maybe the reason God hasn't allowed the measure of persecution promised in the Bible to the western church is because we really don't have the measure of intimacy required to withstand it is the lack of persecution truly a reflection of how good our government and country is or is it more of an exposure of how shallow and how little intimacy we really have as a whole now I'm not saying pray for persecution pray for suffering I, like I, I'm an American I don't even want that <laughs> but I think about these things from time to time 
that sanctify the Lord Christ in your hearts, that abide in me, I in you, you in me. That whole thing, Jesus is literally preparing his disciples to be martyred. He is a shepherd. He's a pastor. Outside of John and Judas, all of them are about to be martyred. And as a good shepherd, he's not telling them, here's, how, here's what you pray to come against the plan of the enemy. He's saying, here's how you go deep so when the time of martyrdom comes, you don't run, you lay down. Because if you're really going to be my friends, if you're really going to be my friends, then you got to be baptized with my baptism, and you got to drink. That's what he's telling John, James and John. Then you really have to drink from the cup that I'm about to be. That whole teaching of intimacy has everything to do with enduring suffering and very little to do with public ministry. Let's keep reading. So sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Let's go to verse 16. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God will it so. Say that, if God will it so. No, no, say that like you believe it. Like I was about to talk about getting a bigger house. If God will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit. Go down to chapter four, verse one. Just a few more verses down. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. That's a church apostle giving apostolic instruction to the church. I was meditating on that this morning. That, that verse, that would, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul talks about we, carry in about, we carry about in our bodies daily the dying of the Lord Jesus. That verse isn't just like this. It's not, it's not talking about denying the flesh. It's just, I'm, I'm constantly living with this willingness and this openness and this readiness to lay it all down. This is one of the questions I get a lot is I teach on weird things like martyrdom. I so say, how do I know if I'm ready for martyrdom? It's very simple. How do you suffer? All right, let's keep going. Are you guys good? Let's read one more here passage out of 1 Peter and we'll move on. Go to verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery Try, a fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing are happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So different than even the way we talk about glory. This is, a, this is an apostle. He's saying, listen, if you suffer well, if you're reviled for the sake of Christ, if you are willing to endure it on you, you've got the spirit of glory. Is it possible that what we call glory and God calls glory might be two very different things? Do you know that every time Jesus talked about glory, he talked about himself on a cross? Every time Jesus said, I'm going to be glorified, 10 out of 10 times, he was referring to his public crucifixion. Because what, what God calls glory and what we call glory, I don't think they're adding up. And I've got a longing in me to experience the real Glory of God. One more verse out of 1 Peter. Verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. I'll tell you just a couple of stories real quick, and then we'll end with Philippians 3. Is that good? Are we good? 
we had a this leader in Iran. This is an interesting, interesting story. I love it. He was from a village, and he was preaching, and they kicked him out of the village, and they said, if you, if you come back and preach, we're going to arrest you. And so he went back to the village to preach because that's what you do, right? Like oh, circumstance doesn't influence obedience. Word of God is all you need for obedience. And he goes back, and guess what happens when he goes back? He gets arrested. He spends the next few days crying in prison, like wailing. To the point that the warden, or not the, warden, uh, the prison guard, the guy over the section, kind of felt uncomfortable. <laughs> he was like, all right, man. And he goes up to the guy and he goes, listen, you know, they don't, they don't treat Christians really nicely in prison in Iran. <laughs> and he says, hey, man, just stop crying. It's a little much. If, I'll, I'll tell them to treat you better. And he looks at the man and he says, I'm not crying because I'm in prison. He said, I never knew I was this worthy to suffer for him. I didn't know. I didn't know the Lord paid it that much attention to me. And the man was so moved by this, he gave himself to the Lord. True story. So guess what happened? The warden found out about it. The warden's like, well, we can't have that. So he, they sent him to a, 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 like a worse section of the prison. He started leading all these people to the Lord. <laughs> so the warden gets really, it's a true story, the warden gets really mad and puts him in a worse pr section of the prison, like murderers and rapists. And he starts leading more people to the Lord. So the warden says, you got to get out of here. Like, you need to call your family and you need to go home. And he says, go home? I just started my prison ministry. I'm not leaving. And the warden was freaked out because he thought that the Iranian government was going to think that he was sanctioning evangelism. So he called the man's family and said, pick him up or we're killing him. They get kicked out of prison. Wow. <laughs> but, the, the, you know, but the point of the story is it's like, like, what a different mindset than we would have. Say another one. Are you guys good with that? I've, I think I've shared this one here before, but pretend you're hearing it for the first time. We had this team, they are getting ready to move to a country. They can't tell you the country. That's one of the worst, it's a one-way ticket. And um, when they're getting ready to go to the country, my friend um, asked them to, to, to write an email stating out that they understand that the, the sobriety of what they're getting ready to do. Because where, where you're going is a one-way ticket. It's one of the top three places for human trafficking, top three for persecution. And he says, I want you to write to me in an email that you understand. This is real because I've heard the audio. I've heard the conversation. I want you to write to me in audio that, if you know, that you understand that and when you get there, one of your daughters will most likely get kidnapped and be sold into the sex trade industry and she'll never be seen again. And it's still worth going. I want you to write to me in an email that you fully understand that the likelihood of either you and or your wife getting martyred within the first few years is extremely likely. That you fully understand it, you get that, and it's still worth going. You will still go. So the wife sends this audio message. It says, we just told our family where we're getting ready to go, and they're incredibly devastated. So my husband had me print out a picture of each of us, the husband, the wife, and I think it was like two or three kids, two or three daughters. And we invited our entire family to the local cemetery and we had our funeral service. And we buried our pictures in the ground. We had our funeral because there was a good chance we were never gonna see our family again. Every one of our kids might get kidnapped. And so we had our funeral and we said, Jesus, we're dead. Do to us whatever you want. I'm not saying that that's what you have to do. That's not, that's not even what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, I often ask the question, is it possible that for some of us, maybe do we really mean the things that we're saying, praying and singing to Jesus? Is it possible that we're flirting around with just a bunch of empty words? 
I don't want at the end of my life to find out I said a lot of great things but had very little substance. I don't want to find out at the end of my life that I had a great ministry and I did a lot of things and I read a lot of books and I met a lot of people, but I didn't actually ever get to know the Lord. I never really worshipped him. Let's go to Philippians 3. I invite the band to come up if that's okay. I'm going to read this, and I've asked them to do a specific song because I'm going to end with the story of this song. I've shared it before, but pretend it's the first time you've heard it. Philippians, but I want to go back to this Philippians 3 place. And the reason is because, I mean, when I was coming here in 2007, and I was getting touched by the Lord right over there, I would, I would go, when I got back home to Fort Mouth, Florida, I spent a whole year at Philippians 3, and I feel this like Philippians 3 thing just coming back. You see, worship, a life of worship is a lot more than good music and good singing. Worship is when we reveal, we expose how much we think the Lord is really worth. I mean, it's easy, it's, it's so easy especially when you're in a a corporate, it's so easy to say grandiose things to God. But it's really difficult to live them. It's really difficult to keep saying those grandiose statements when everything's coming against you. I mean, it's easy to worship when you're in a conference. It's very difficult to worship when you're on a cross. And here's my question to us as as a church community, as a church body, how much is Jesus actually worth to us? I mean, you know, it's easy to lay down television or Pokemon, but to lay down the God called comfort and convenience and, and to lay down to, to be willing to be cheated or lied or persecuted or whatever. I mean, like, to, let's look at this, Philippians 3. I'm just going to read this to us. Is that, is that okay? I'm just going to read this because it's powerful. Although, starting in verse 4, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anything else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisees, the zeal of persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted loss for the sake of Christ. Or oh, that God would bring us back to Philippians 3, 7. Whatever things were gained, Whatever I counted as blessing or riches, I I forsake it. It's all lost compared to the true treasure of the knowledge of God. Would you rather be rich in money and material possessions or rich in the knowledge of God? More than that, verse 8, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. May you, really? Would you be willing to count everything you have as rubbish just to gain Christ? Do we know Christ? Do we know how much he's actually worth? Do we know the value of the Christ? I may gain Christ first. I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Verse 10, that I may know him. It's much more than a new car or a big bank account or, 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 or a bigger house or comfort, much more that I may know Him. Not know about Him. Not be able to quote a bunch of YouTubes or podcasts. Like, I want to know Him. Like Peter did. 
who when he was brought to be crucified said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. To know him. You know, you got to know him to say, I'm ready to have my life poured out like a drink offering. You got to actually know that God that you're singing about. I believe there's, before the Lord returns, there's going to be a great drink offering generation that the Lord raises up. That the, that the high calling of God for them won't be platform, won't be position, but it'll be like Paul to pour out their lives like a drink offering so that behind them could come the greatest harvest we've ever seen in history. That I may be found, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And what, what happens in charismatic circles? We put a period there. Right there, we stop it. I may know him and the power of his resurrection. But there's something greater than power. It's called fellowship. And Jesus didn't invite us to the table of power. He invited us to the table of communion, to the table of fellowship. He didn't just break his body so yours doesn't have to get broken. No, no, no. He broke his body to empower you to break yours. He didn't just shed his blood to cover your sins. He shed his blood to empower you to shed yours. In Luke 9, when Jesus says, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That has nothing to do with not watching television. Luke 9, when he says, take up your cross, he was saying, take up your cross because I'm about to show you, I'm going to model it for you. He's saying, I want you to be willing, it's the context is be willing to die for unbelievers. I've been asking myself this question. I've seen some weird people at the Walmart in this city. <laughs> but would I be willing to be betrayed by my best friend, abandoned by everybody I know, and put naked on a cross for some weird backwoods guy from Hamilton, Alabama? That's what Jesus is talking about in Luke chapter 9 that you would so disregard your earthly life in pursuit for the glory of the eternal life. Oh, that I may be found in him that having a right to right. Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Because I don't just want a power ministry. I want to be his friend. I want to feel the emotions of God. In order that I, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Stand to your feet tonight. I asked him to end with the song. Very specifically, because I, I want to tell you the story of how the song was written. And this will be our call. Is that good? Is that good, Miss Karen? I asked him to do the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. Do you know how that song was written? Years ago, these Indian missionaries from India decided to move their family to an unreached people group within India. So they're Indians going to another part of India where there were people who were unreached. And I don't know if it was a couple of years or whatever, they kept preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, and nobody would get saved. And finally, the people got fed up with it. So they brought the family to the front of the village. And I don't know how it works in Hindu culture, but I guess the leader of the community said, we're sick of this gospel. They brought out the first child and said, deny Jesus, we'll kill your child. And the Lord gave that man that song. And he looked up at his executioner and he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. I thought that was his response. So they killed the first child. They brought the next child. Same thing. Did, we're sick of this gospel. We don't want to hear this. We'll kill your next child. We killed your first one. What's your response? I have decided to follow Jesus. Then they brought the man's wife. The same thing. Same response. I have decided to follow Jesus. And they killed her. Then they killed the man. 
And after they killed all of them, they were so pricked that the whole village gave themselves to the Lord. And after they gave themselves to the Lord, they said, we've got to write down that song that he sang. And so years later, when Baptist missionaries showed up to this village and they found that what they thought was an unreached village, and they found out that the whole village was converted, they said, oh, who converted you? And they told the story of that family and gave them that song. I don't know where you're at in your life with the Lord. I don't know if you're addicted to, I don't know where you're at, but I want to make a call to us tonight as a church community, as a church family, to take Jesus really serious. I don't want to just end, I don't want to stand at the end of my life, just stand before the Lord. And the Lord said, you said a lot of things, but you hardly meant most of, most of them. He didn't really mean it. I want to mean this stuff. I want to live it. So just do this. Just, just don't close your eyes, but examine your heart. Close your eyes. Don't close. I don't care, but examine your heart. 